Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Primary HPV Cervical Cancer Screening, Supporting Data and Guidance Updates. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Roche Molecular Diagnostics. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Julia Engstrom Melnick, Medical and Scientific Affairs at Roche Diagnostics Corporation. I will now turn it over to Julia for her presentation. Uh, thank you, Judy, and welcome to, the, to today's webinar. Uh, we're at an exciting time for HPV uh, or cervical cancer screening. Um, in 2014, the first uh, HPV test was approved for primary HPV uh, screening indication. And now in 2015, we have the first published interim guidance for uh, the use of primary HPV. So the PAP test was first introduced by Dr. Babes and Papanicolo in the 1920s. Soon after, it became evident that this technique could potentially reduce the burden of cervical cancers by finding developing cases, allowing for earlier treatment and preventing further progression. Countries began introducing screening programs based on this test in the 1950s, and in 1975, ACOG issued their first cervical cancer screening recommendations, annual PAP testing for women 18 years and older. The adoption has led to dramatic reductions in cervical cancer rates. But despite the tremendous success of cervical cancer screening, there's still a need to reduce the cancer rates further. The most significant is an access to screening. The majority of women diagnosed with cervical cancer within both the Kaiser Patient Reg Registry and the Swedish National Health Registry either had not been screened or did not receive a recent screen in the last five years. But cervical cancer still occurs in women that have been screened. In both of these uh, audits, we see that about 32% in the Kaiser and about 24% in the Swedish system uh, were due to failures of cytology-based screening. So it's important to understand the limitations of the tests we use if we hope to improve upon them. It is well known that one of the main limitations of cytology is its low sensitivity for detecting high-grade disease. In fact, there have been multiple attempts to help improve its sensitivity over the years, including workload limits, liquid-based cytology, and computer-assisted screening. However, these attempts have done little to impact the overall low sensitivity of cytology or in the detection of AIS and adenocarcinoma. Also, because cytology relies on a subjective impression of cellular changes and cervical cancer precursors as they occur, there is often very low reproducibility. And cytology can identify women with advanced disease but not provide insights as to who may be at risk of developing this in the future. Therefore, cytology has a very lo uh, limited long-term predictive value. So despite the implementation of cytology-based screening, the incidence of adenocarcinoma is increasing. This demonstrates that cytology-based screening methods are missing adenocarcinoma and its precursors lesions most likely due to lim sampling limitations and an under-representation of glandu glandular cells. Sampling bias has greater implications when a less sensitive method is used. 
The subjectivity of cytology is demonstrated on this slide. As part of the ALTS trial, the National Cancer Institute had about 5,000 slides reread by second cytopathologists. Each reviewer interpreted slides slightly differently, with only about 78% of slides originally classified as normal uh, were considered normal or negative by the second cytopathologist. And as expected, the reproducibility of the equivocal diagnosis of ASCIS was fairly low at 43%. But what's most compelling of this is that only 47% of the slides originally classified as high grade were diagnosed as high grade on review. Needless to say, Cytology-based screening has been very successful despite the fact that the underlying cause of the disease was not known. In the 1970s, Harold Zurhausen first published the, his hypothesis between the link of HPV and cervical cancer. And since then, there has been tremendous amount of research and our knowledge in this area has grown exponentially. In fact, in 1995, the International Agency for the Research on Cancer, which is part of the WHO, classified HPV 16 and 18 as carcinogenic and concluded that HPV infection is a necessary cause of cervical cancer. Today, we, know, we now know that almost all cervical cancers are caused by a small subset of HPV genotypes. The association between HPV and cervical cancer is extraordinarily strong. For example, the odds of having cervical cancer if a woman is HPV 16 positive versus an HPV negative woman is 435. And if we compare that to the odds of a male smoker versus a non-smoker for developing lung cancer of only eight. In fact, just two HPV genotypes, HPV 16 and HPV 18, are responsible for approximately 70% of all cervical cancers. So with this background, the FDA approved the first HPV test in 1999. And since then, cervical cancer guidelines continue to evolve to provide data-driven recommendations the highlight that the preferred method for screening includes an HPV test. Additionally, algorithms also incorporate HPV 16 and HPV 18 genotyping. With our evolving understanding of HPV and despite growing awareness of cervical cancer limitations, Cytology-based screening remains one of the most widely used screening modalities. However, based on the limitations of cytology, per the 2011 Cervical Cancer Screening Guidelines, cytology screening at a three-year interval is now considered an acceptable option for women 30 to 65, but is no longer indicated as preferred. For women 21 to 29, it's the recommended screening option due to concerns around excessive HPV positivity in younger women. However, new data has since become available that provides an approach that makes HPV testing a viable option for these younger women. For women 30 to 65, incorporating HPV testing alongside the PAP is considered the preferred method in these 2011 uh, screening guidelines. The use of the HPV test increases the sensitivity of the initial screen and allows for extended screening intervals. Cytology negative and HPV positive women should be followed up with either repeat co-testing in 12 months or immediate HPV 16 and 18 genotyping. If immediate HPV genotyping, women testing positive for HPV 16 or 8, 16 and 18 should be referred directly to colposcopy. Whereas women with negative results should be co-tested in 12 months. 
HPV testing provides several ben benefits over cytology. Due to its higher sensitivity, incorporating HPV DNA testing leads to a reduction in the detection of CIN3 or greater or cancer in subsequent rounds of screening, which allows for longer safety intervals. HPV DNA testing improves detection of AIS and adenocarcinoma, and HPV is the first necessary cause of a human cancer ever identified. Its presence identifies women at risk of developing cervical cancer, and it can also help determine who, which women are at the highest risk. And more importantly, its absence provides reassurance of low, short, and long-term cervical cancer risk. In fact, HPV DNA testing reduces the incidence of invasive cervical cancer compared to cytology. Here's the pooled data from four large-scale European randomized trials, which included over 176,000 women and over 1.2 million person years of follow-up. Between two and three years after screening, there begins to be an increase in the detection of invasive cervical cancer in women who were cytology negative, a baseline, which is the gray line, versus the women who are HPV negative, which is the blue line. Overall, HPV DNA-based screening reduced the cervical cancer rates by 60 to 70%, demonstrating that when compared to cytology-based screening, HPV DNA testing offers greater safety and reduces long-term incidence of cervical cancer. It should be noted that the benefit of a combined cytology and HPV test is predominantly due to the negative predictive value of the HPV test, as the risk is not dramatically improved when cytology is added to the HPV test. When it comes to risk of cervical cancer, there is no statistical difference. HPV testing alone provides the same reassurance against cervical cancer as a co-test. In 2014, the FDA approved the first HPV DNA test for primary HPV screening indication based on the improved safety of this strategy over cytology-based screening. In response, following review of the FDA submission data and newly published findings from several large-scale studies, SGO and ASCCP jointly published interim guidance for the use of primary HPV screening. This guidance document affirms that HPV primary screening is an option for women 25 years and older. This is the algorithm descri described in the guidance document. For women 25 years and older, an HPV test FDA approved for primary screening indication would be used in conjunction with HPV 16 and 18 genotyping. This not only relies on a, the more sensitive and non-subjective test as a first-line test, but also incorporates immediate risk stratification. Women testing negative have a very low risk of cervical precancer both at the time of screening and over the next few years. And so they should not be screened sooner than three years. Women positive for HPV 16 and or 18 are those women at the highest risk of cervical precancer and cancer and should be referred for colposcopy for additional follow-up. Women HPV positive but negative for HPV 16 and 18 are at a much lower risk but they're not without risk. Cytology is used to triage these women uh, to identify which, one, which ones in the subset have detectable cellular changes that would warrant immediate colposcopy. So this guidance document was developed based on extensive literature and data review and in discussion with representatives from seven different professional societies. They determined that Primary HPV screening is an alternative to current cervical cancer screening methods due to equivalent or superior effectiveness. 
A negative high-risk HPV test provides greater reassurance of low CIN3 or greater risk than a negative cytology result. Primary HPV screening can include women 25 to 29. And they also highlighted that only FDA-approved assays with specific primary HPV screening indications should be used. The effectiveness of primary HPV screening is mainly determined by the risks associated with a negative screening result. Risk of CIN3 or greater over three years following a negative HPV test at baseline, which is the lower curve in blue, is half that following a negative PAP at baseline, which is the upper curve in gray. As, as expected, the rise in the slope is much more pronounced following a negative PAP than a negative HPV result, highlighting that long-term risk assessment is limited when only assessing current cell abnormalities. These findings are also mirrored across several additional large-scale studies. A negative HPV test resulted in at least half the three and five-year risk of both CIN3 or greater and and cervical cancer than cytology. Additionally, HPV 16 and 18 genotyping provides greater risk stratification, not only identifying women with the highest probability of having an underlying high-grade lesion of baseline, but also over the screening interval. In Athena, one in four women with a baseline HPV 16 positive result develop CIN3 or greater within three years. Although lower than, than HPV-16 positive women, HPV-18 positive women were still at a statistically higher risk of developing CIN3 or greater than, than those positive for the 12 other high-risk types, exceeding 10% uh, for CIN3 within three years. Women positive for, H, for the other 12 high-risk HPV types are at a substantially lower risk for CIN3 or greater, reaching about 5% risk within five, three years. Whereas HPV status will predict which women are essential free from risk, HPV genotyping more accurately predicts which women will subsequently develop high-grade uh, cervical cancer precursors. This risk stratification uh, better assesses a woman's need for immediate colposcopy and helps balance the rates of referral to disease case detected. As we try to simplify how we screen by introducing, HPV, uh, introducing primary HPV screening, a consideration must be made as to when to initiate screening. In 2011, the 2011 U.S. screening guidelines did not recommend HPV testing for women 25 to 29, unless it was used as a reflex to an ASCA cytology. This is largely because HPV infections are common in this age group and are typically transient. However, in the interim guidance document that was just published, the professional societies did acknowledge that there is a high burden of CIN3 in this age group in cytology, which is so far the only option, performs poorly in this population. But because these, these recommendations are a departure from the previous guide, guidelines, there are a few questions that should be addressed. Why include women 25 to 29? How is high prevalence of high-risk HPV and referrals and then referrals to colposcopy balanced in this age group, and what considerations should be made around re regression of high-grade disease in young women. So first, let's take a look at the incidence of cervical cancer by age group in the U.S. Data from the National Can Inst Cancer Institute's CR tumor registry shows that a sharp rise in the incidence of cervical can invasive cervical cancer occurs between the age of 25 and 34. 
Cervical cancer screening is unique in that we can detect and manage cervical cancer precursors before cervical cancer develops. So the ultimate goal of cervical cancer screening is not to detect cancer, but to prevent the diagnosis of cervical cancer. This suggests that, it, that initiation of screening should ideally occur during the sharp increase in cervical cancer incidence just prior to the peak. In practice, we do screen women over the age of 21. But the question is, are we screening effectively? In Athena, the large-scale US-based registrational trial referenced in the guidance document a third of all identified cervical precancers in women 25 years and older were found in women 25 to 29 years of age. To put this into perspective, uh, let's look how this, let's put these numbers based on population size. So in fact, more high grade high grade disease was found in the 6,647 women in this five year age range than in any other age group. This demonstrates that the highest disease burden is in women 25 to 29. And keep in mind, this age range is also at the, at the start of the sharp incline in cervical cancer diagnoses. So are we effective in current screening practices? Remember, the 2011 screening guidelines recommended that the preferred method for screening women 30 years and older is a combined cytology and an HPV test, meaning that these women basically have a safety net with incorporation of HPV testing. For women 25 to 29, cytology is still the, the only method um, according to the 2011 screening guidelines. But cytology, which is a standard of care, failed to detect more than 56% of cervical precancers in women 25 to 29. This is more than any other age group and in an age range that has the highest burden of cervical cancer or cervical precancer. It suggests that current screening with cytology is inadequate in identifying underlying CIN3 or greater. It simply is not sensitive enough. But if we simply screen for HPV, effectively increasing sensitivity, a large proportion of women may be referred for follow-up testing. As expected, HPV positivity is the highest in the youngest age group and declines with age. In Athena, about 21% of women 25 to 29 years of age were high risk HPV positive. So how can we balance this high prevalence of high risk HPV and referrals to colposcopy in this age group? One way to reduce reduce immediate referrals is to focus on the group of women that are at the highest risk of cervical cancer, women that are positive for HPV 16 or 18. In Athena, only about 7% of women 25 to 29 were positive for one of these two genotypes. And in comparison, the proportion of women 25 to 29 that are positive for 16 and 18 is actually smaller than the than the total number with abnormal cytology results for that same age range. By simply using HPV 16 and 18 genotyping for women 25 to 29, which is the smallest group of women with the highest association to cervical precancer, would be referred for immediate colposcopy. With this shift in screening strategy for women 25 to 29, look how much better we can do. We can increase the effectiveness of screening by detecting 30% more CIN3 or greater cases than by cytology. And that's just for HPV 16 and 18 positive cases. 
Incorporating the 12 other high-risk HPV types will improve the detection of CIN3 or greater even further. And it's important to note that high-grade disease found in young women is more likely associated with HPV-16 than any other genotype. And the mean age of a HPV-16 positive CIN3 or greater lesion is below the age of 30. HPV-16 positive CIN3 was more commonly diagnosed in younger women versus older women further highlighting the effectiveness of genotyping in screening younger women. In fact, even, if, even in the very youngest age groups, so these women are 13 to 24, which presumably have the highest overall clearance rates, HPV 16 and 18 lesions are less likely to regress than non-HPV 16 and 18 ones. But if we take this a step further, we can look at the overall effectiveness of various screening methods, including women 25 to 29. In discussions of cervical cancer screening and screening modalities, the recent ACS ASCCP ASCP cervical cancer screening guidelines of 2011 specifically acknowledge that the benefits of screening should be balanced between the potential harms with the total number of colposcopies serving as a surrogate measure of harms. The Athena study provides an opportunity to evaluate both the benefit and potential harms of screening when various combinations of cytology, high-risk HPV testing, and genotyping for HPV 16 and 18 are used to develop screening algorithms for women 25 years and older. For simplicity's sake, the focus will be on three algorithms supported by U.S. screening guidelines. The first is cytology, which relies on HPV testing to triage ASCIS results for women 25 years and older. The second is a co-testing strategy, relying on a one-year co-test rescreen of women with normal, normal cytology and HPV positive results. Keep in mind that this co-testing strategy is only for women 30 years and older. And the third screening modality is the primary HPV screening algorithm supported by SGO and ASCCP as a screening option for women 25 years and older. Because the analysis evaluate the performance in two age groups, so women 25 years and older and women 30 years and older, certain modifications to the co-testing screening algorithm need to be accounted for. For women 25 years and older, a hybrid strategy is used, which combines the cytology method for women 25 to 29 and with the co-testing algorithm for women 30 years and older. Women 30 years and older are essentially only co-tested. When comparing the effectiveness or efficiency of the screening methods, we can look at the number of CIN3 or greater lesions detected and the number of colposcopies performed. And more specifically, the number of colposcopies that would be required to be, would be required to be performed per disease case detected. For women 25 years and older, primary HPV screening detected nearly 40% more CIN3 or greater at baseline than either of the two screening methods. The superior performance extends over the three years with more than 20% or greater than 20% more CIN3 or greater cases detected than the hybrid strategy and 64% more than cytology for women 25 years and older. For women 30 years and older, primary HPV screening detected nearly 30% more CIN3 or greater cases at baseline than either of the two screening methods. 
By year three, it detected 50% more CI in three or greater cases than cytology, and the co-testing methods nearly caught up. But keep in mind that many of these subsequent cases may remain undetected if, remain undetected if a loss to follow-up is a concern in clinical practice. Although higher than cytology, the number of colposcopies performed per identified case of CIN3 or greater for primary HPV screening was nearly identical to the hybrid strategy for both age groups. But how does this screening compare, or how does this perform in women 25 to 29? By extending HPV primary screening down to age 25 from 30, 102 additional CIN3 or greater cases are detected versus only 51 by cytology. This is exactly twice the number of CIN3 cases detected by primary HPV screening than cytology. With this increased sensitivity, the number of colposcopies would naturally also increase. By including women 25 to 29, 1,247 additional colposcopies will be performed with primary HPV screening. However, this is actually less than twice the number of additional colposcopies performed following cytology. This means that the higher proportional gain in CIN3 or greater and sensitivity for women 25 to 29 actually makes the colposcopies performed more efficient in a primary HPV screening method. In other words, HPV, primary HPV screening identifies more cases of CIN3 or greater than cytology while requiring fewer colposcopies per disease case detected for women 25 to 29 proving that HPV primary screening is the most effective screening strategy for this age group. In a similar vein, if we add cytology testing for women 25 to 29 to the co-testing hybrid strategy, essentially bringing that age group down too, the number of colposcopies needed to detect each CI3 case actually dec decreased compared to primary HPV screening indicating uh, or shifted, indicating a lower efficiency. This is mainly due to the, to the significantly fewer cases of CIN3 cases detected when relying on cytology for this age group. As we try to improve how we screen by introducing primary, H uh, primary HPV screening, a consideration must be made as to when to initiate or begin this, uh, this new screening method. There is a high burden of CIN3 in women 25 to 29, and cytology, which is the current standard of care, performs poorly in this population. HPV testing increases the sensitivity and detection of these high-grade lesions and strategies relying on HPV 16 and 18 genotyping can effect effectively stratify risk and limit referrals to colposcopy. The rate of colposcopies is actually not an accurate measure of potential harms of screening, as risks associated with procedures and treatments accompanying these may actually have been overstated. And it's also important to consider that there must be a threshold for which a colposcopy is acceptable, even for women 25 to 29. It may be that the potential discomfort and anxiety associated with a follow-up procedure is tolerated if the alternative is a missed precancerous lesion. It's clear that cervical cytology appears to have reached the point where it alone is unable to reduce cervical cancer rates further. The benefits of HPV primary screening include the increased detection of cervical precancer, detection of cervical uh, cancer precursors, especially in women 25 to 29. 
The best balance of benefits and harms of using HPV testing as a first line primary screen is a triage strategy that includes an integrated HPV 16 and 18 result with cytology of the 12 other high risk HPV genotypes. Primary HPV testing is now an alternative, alternative option to current cytology based screening methods due to equivalent or superior effectiveness. And with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. I'm going to pass it back over to Judy, so hopefully we can get to some of your questions. Um, and if, if all the questions aren't answered, I give you my full promise that I will uh, address each one individually. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, does the FDA approved HPV test test only HPV 16 and 18, not other high risk strains? Um, I think I have a hard time hearing the volume is not really working. I think the question was, did the FDA approve 16 and 18 only? Um, so the FDA approval for primary uh, HPV screening includes all 14 high risk genotypes. That's basically standard for an HPV test nowadays. Where the FDA approval uh, was a little bit more specific is that they had to consider this balance between excessive HPV positivity and the management of women uh, for colposcopy. So the algorithm or the approval for the FDA was an incorporation of HPV 16 and 18 simultaneous genotyping to the detection of the remainder of the high risk HPV types. So in total, we're looking at all 14 high risk types um, and we're getting a result for all of those, but the 16 and 18 women are uniquely identified at the same time. Okay, next. Um, do all women with 16 or 18, will they eventually develop cervical cancer? So that's an interesting question. And actually um, being 16 positive or 18 positive doesn't mean you will develop cervical cancer. Um, what it will kind of help a clinician decide and a patient to decide is, is how high your potential risk is. Um, cervical cancer is still fairly rare in this country and only a small subset will actually reach that stage of invasive cervical cancer. Um, but by knowing your genotype, you also under, you can start to learn what your risks are over the next few years. Women that are positive for HPV 16 and HPV 18 are at a higher risk, but not, it does not necessarily mean that cancer is inevitable. Um, and that's why it's really important to talk to your doctor about strategies and management and follow up, um, just to make sure that, um, those women are followed accordingly um, to, again, to help prevent uh, invasive cervical cancer from developing. Okay, you're now asked, how is the HPV testing done? Is it a blood draw, tissue? What are the costs compared to pap smear? Uh, so right now, all HPV testing is done on a, the similar sample as, as a pap smear or pap collection. Um, so that hasn't changed. There is new uh, research and uh, studies looking at a uh, vaginal collection or even a self-collection, um, but that 
is not FDA approved, those type of collections. Um, it is not yet a blood test. Um, I uh, unfortunately can't really address the, the costs because I think there's going to be a lot of that's going to be dependent, um, both in terms of the H individual HPV tests, uh, reimbursements and things like that. So fortunately, I cannot address that portion of the question. Okay, how are the other 12 HR types reported and used by the clinician? Um, sure, so I can, I'll, I'll speak to the COBOS HPV test, which is uh, the Roche test and the one that's approved for, FDA approved for primary HPV screening. Uh, this test looks or is, is designed to detect 14 high-risk HPV genotypes. How it's designed is that in this pool of 14, it will actually individually look for an HPV 16 and an HPV 18, and then look to see what other 12 high-risk HPV genotypes are present. Um, labs actually have their own way of reporting results to clinicians. Um, most labs using the COBOS HPV test will provide an HPV 16 result, HPV 18 result, and then also a result for those 12 other high-risk HPV genotypes. So in essence, you have a, a result for all 14, but with specific uh, reports for 16 and 18. Are HPV, are missed HPV plus cases in women 25 to 29 due to the lack of PAPs being performed for this age range, or does the PAP actually perform more poorly in these instances? Yeah, so um, a lot of that is largely unknown. Um, PAP and cytology performance really depends on an adequate sampling and an adequate collection of the transformation zone or um, that portion of the cervix where HPV and cervical cancer develops. Um, women at different stages of their, uh, I guess their life cycle, I hate to use that word, but at different stages um, of their lives will have actually a different shape of a cervix. And it may be that younger women um, are, have their uh, transformation zone or the collection site is a lot less accessible. And when you rely on, on a very low, a test with very low sensitivity, any sort of uh, complications or limitations with collection is going to have a much greater impact um, than if you were using a very highly sensitive test. And so uh, by using HPV testing instead of cytology, you can kind of overcome any sort of collection bias or, or collection limitations. Um, again, because it's much more sensitive and looking for the specific cause or the specific virus that will lead to cervical cancer. Another one for you, is the FDA approval for the Roche HR HPV testing only, uh, or is it accepted to test with other methods, example, service, et cetera? Um, so, so the SGO and ASCCP guidance document was actually really clear on the fact that an FDA approved assay for the specific indication, which is primary HPV testing should be used. The reason is that each of these HPV tests that are available, um, and there are four that are currently FDA approved in general, all have slightly different performance uh, characteristics. Um, so without that, that evaluation by the FDA, um, it's, well, you can't assume equivalency between them. An FDA will specifically uh, evaluate these assays for safety. Um, 
and the low risk of uh, developing CIN3 or greater over a long time, over a longer period. Um, so without that, basically that stamp of a con confirmation of safety, it's, um, it's very difficult to say that you can use any other test. The next question is a two-parter. Does the FDA labeling require cytology as a reflex to HPV positive non-1618 results? And the second part, do all HPV positive patients go directly to colposcopy or just 18 or 1618 positive? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, the FDA approval um, actually looks a lot like the guidance, uh, the algorithm that was provided in the uh, guidance document by SGO and AACCP. Uh, there is a 16 and 18 uh, genotyping. Those women are referred immediately for colposcopy because they are at the highest risk for having an underlying or even developing a cervical precancer within the, the three-year interval. Um, but the 12 other high-risk HPV genotypes, um, because there is a concern with uh, sending every woman HPV positive to colposcopy, there has to be a little bit of a balance there. The vast majority of women who test HPV positive will actually be positive for the 12 other high-risk types and not 16 and 18. Uh, so these women are actually, or the, the collection of these women are actually uh, triaged through cytology. And cytology will look at those samples and determine which ones actually have underlying or uh, current cell abnormalities detected by cytology. And those women are at the highest risk in that little pool um, and they are referred to colposcopy. Um, so, and the women with the 12 other HPV positive but are PAP negative, so without any detectable cellular changes are rescreened in a year. And again, it's really to help balance this high rate of HPV positivity with the need for colposcopy. So essentially, what we're doing is identifying the women at the highest risk and those women who should um, be immediately evaluated. Those with a lower risk um, can be deferred because the progression to cervical cancer is actually uh, fairly slow. Um, and so that's how that balance works. Um, there's absolutely a cytology component. Um, without it, there would just be um, a large proportion being sent to colposcopy. Your next one is, what is the false negative rate of the Cobos HPV test? And um, I didn't quite catch that, the false negative rate. Um, so what we're looking for here is, um, the detection of disease and really what a negative result means. Um, this is always assessed based on the current standard of care or the, the threshold of care, and that's cytology. The benefit of an HPV uh, test is really to detect more of those CIN3 cases that are just missed by cytology. Um, to determine a false negative is, is actually pretty hard for, um, an, for cervical cancer screening because there's a lot of subjectivity that goes into uh, disease ascertainment. Um, not only is cytology very su subjective, but colposcopy and potential biopsies at time of colposcopy is also highly subjective. Um, and without sampling and the entire cervix and, and just basically excising all of it to look for any sort of disease, um, it's very hard to, to actually put that into perspective. What we do look at is how well each test and each algorithm is at detecting high-grade disease that's detectable. 
in this case, an HPV negative case uh, or the COBOS HPV test, um, there was about a 0.3% risk of having a CIN3 or greater detected within three years, um, which again is half the risk of cytology. Your next question is, what races are represented in the presented statistics? Um, I don't think I quite heard that. I think the question was what races were represented. So Athena specifically was a general screening population and actually the uh, distribution of women and the demographics of the Athena actually matches uh, the general U.S. population. Next question is, um, how, can HPV, how can HPV testing help detect AIS? Um, so HPV testing, the benefit of HPV testing is really the higher sensitivity. Um, and there are studies that are, have been published looking at HPV testing versus cytology in the detection of AIS and adenocarcinoma. It's actually significantly higher than what you detect by cytology. Again, cytology is really dependent on adequate sampling and correct sampling to detect these kind of lesions. Um, and because they are, the cytology is so much less sensitive, it's even more uh, influenced by collection and adequate collection. Um, HPV testing, because you're looking for the presence of the virus, you actually need only a few cells that are infected to really be able to identify women at risk. Um, so there is less of a threshold to, to overcome with an HPV test to detect these type of lesions. Okay, um, we have a bunch more questions coming in. And so um, I'm just going to pause for a moment to allow, um, to allow the next question um, to pass through. So bear with me one moment here and, and I will share another question with you. We're actually, we're getting um, a flood of questions. And just bear with us for a moment. And I, I think we'll just have time probably for one more question. So we're just sifting through to, to determine that last question. Okay, let's see, here we go. Bear with me a second here. In the case of a negative HPV result, how do you know that the transformation zone has been sampled and that it is a true negative HPV? I'm sorry, Judy, can I pass it back to you? I didn't quite hear the question. Absolutely, okay. In the case of a negative HPV result, how do you know that the transformation zone has been sampled and that it is a true negative HPV? Hope that's, hope that is better. Okay, sorry about that. I heard it this time. Um, so I, I can, again, I can speak to the COBOS HPV test uh, specifically for, to answer this question. Um, the COBOS test hasn't, it, built, <laughs> getting feedback, uh, a built-in uh, cellular internal control. 
So that actually tells a clinician or a laboratory that uh, cells have been collected and have been sampled. Um, it looks for beta globin, which is uh, present in all human cells. Um, and that will provide either a valid or an invalid result. If there is insufficient cells or if there is no human cells or are no human cells present, uh, you can get an invalid result if the HPV is negative. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. Any questions not addressed live during the allotted time will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. For more information, we would like to invite you to visit www.hpv16and18.com. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Roche Molecular Diagnostics, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 10th. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for a replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.